Dear subscribers, as you know, we shared many information for you, and we are studying very hard to find current news for you. However, I cannot use this channel for future. Please follow our new channel called As Daily News Report and watch our video to support us. Link in description. Also, you can reach the video we shared on Daily News Report by clicking on the top right button. We highly recommend watching, subscribing and sharing. We will continue to share some news on this channel where we take precautions against some situations for future. Thank you for supporting us. 100 point drop in the Dow, which you know is you know a little over two or three percent. Um, and really, we haven't seen the Dow at this level since August. So, what is happening right now? I know you. Um, I know Trump is blaming it on the Fed, the Fed's policies. So, what is the cause of all this? Well, uh, you know, he was uh, flip flopping on this issue greatly. And by the way, I voted for Donald Trump. I'm not trying to be political here. I'm just saying that the truth is that, you know, when he was running for president, the Federal Reserve was way too easy. They were blow, uh, serial bubble blowers. And now that he's in office, they're crazy. They're loco. And, you know, they, he, he's not going to fire Powell, but he better watch his behind. So there's a little duplicity there in his comments. But I'll say this. You asked, why is this happening? And my, my response viscerally is, well, what took so long? <laughs> you know, um, if you look at the, uh, the, the global economy and everywhere you look, you pick China. I, I mean, is, have you looked at the Shanghai Stock Exchange lately? It's down about 23 percent, 24 percent on the year and down 30 percent from its high. I mean, I can go all around the world from from Turkey to Poland to Brazil. I mean, all these stock markets are, you know, either in a bear market or have crashed. And, you know, I can define crash as close to 30 percent and their currencies are in in a debacle and their bond markets. I mean, look at Italy. Italy's in a debacle and their their uh, 10 year note yield went to three point six percent. You know, their, their yields are surging. And Greece is in, a, in a, a stock market debacle. So you say, well, what, what's going on with the United States? And I'm going to tell you, well, thank, you know, uh, thank goodness. And I say thank goodness because not that I'm a person who wishes bad things upon the United States. I love the United States. I say thank goodness because finally, maybe. And by the way, we're just barely scratching the surface here, Elijah. If you look at and I always come on your program and, and say this. The total market cap to GDP now in stocks is still about 147 percent of the underlying economy. Okay, that has never before happened outside of the Y2K tech bubble. So maybe, you know, thankfully, stocks can come down to earth. And, you know, in 1987, the total market cap to GDP before the market crashed was 66 percent. It's usually around. That's the that's the healthy le level. You know, why is the stock market one and a half times the underlying economy? This is not safe for seniors. This is not safe for people who are buy and hold uh, strategists. So we want the stock market to fall so it can become more viable, more in line with the underlying economy. So thank God, finally, our economy is catching up what's going on in the, around the world. And what's, what's the progenitor for all of this is that central banks' balance sheets are finally falling. You know, it didn't really matter if debt was surging, if central banks were lockstep buying bonds. Well, yields were quiescent and everything was uh, rosy, hunky-dory. Now that central banks are getting out of that uh, business of monetizing debt and manipulating interest rates, interest rates have started to rise, LIBOR has spiked, and we're just, you know, Elijah, we're just starting this process now. So unlike the carnival barkers and talking heads you might hear on CNBC, he'll tell you, you know, every dip is a buying opportunity. Uh, I will, you know, lovingly caution you to think twice before you do that. Definitely. Now, you're talking about how really the central bank's policies it, that you're saying that's really a major cause of why we're seeing this pullback or 
I mean, kind of reval- correct revaluation, right, of the stock market. Do you see this continuing? Because I know you were recently uh, writing about this and you were saying that it looks like a major shift is happening because of what the central bank's policies, how they're changing to be more hawkish. Uh, there's this major shift that's going to happen and it's going to continue throughout the rest of this year and into 2019. Well, one of the reasons why I'm now net neutral of stocks in the portfolio and why my model portfolio didn't get hurt in this recent sell off is because I believe the growth rate in earnings is going to plummet, Elijah, plummet. And I don't use that word flippantly. So earnings on the S&P 500 were growing at 25% year on year. And you look if you look at next year's earnings, growth rates, the second derivative, it's going to go from 25% to maybe one or two. And it could even go negative. And there's peak margins. Wages are rising. Oil prices have, have risen, the dollar stronger, chaos in emerging markets, a much, much higher um, interest rate expense on corporations. We're lapping the tax cuts, so, so that's going to go away. Repatriation of, of foreign capital, that's behind us. So there's so many reasons why the growth rate in earnings is going to plummet from 25% to near zero. And if you're slapping a 16 times multiple on earnings per share uh, with no growth, that's a problem. So I think the earnings per share projections for 2019 are way too high. And the earnings growth rates that you put on that those earnings are way too high. So we're going to have a really difficult, difficult time in 2019. You know, corporate buybacks, which were fueled by corporations going out, issuing debt for near 0% interest rates, buying back their shares, kept zombie companies alive, kept the the uh, bond market, junk bond market afloat. All of that is gone in 2019. So uh, I, would, I would suggest that when the stock market is at 147% of GDP, way over its skis as far as valuation is concerned, if you look at uh, not only that valuation metric, but how about price to sales at an all time high price to book at an all time high Tobin's Q ratio, very, very elevated. I can go on and on about all these metrics that show that the stock market is extremely overvalued. And when you have an extremely overvalued stock market that slams into global Q- QE ending on a net basis and 14 of the 20 biggest central banks of the world hiking interest rates. It's not just the Federal Reserve. You know, it's just wise and prudent to be a little bit cautious. Definitely. Now, I mean, you're talking about how a lot of sectors of the economy are not doing very well, even though we're hearing, you know, the economy is great. We see the stock market, even though it's down, it's still way above. It's risen you know, uh, a lot. Well, uh, yeah. The Dow was up. The Dow was up three, four percent this year before as it's recording. So it's it. it you know, people say, oh, even if the I'm, I'm trying to help you. So the Fang stocks. You know, if you look at Facebook, App, App, uh, Apple, Netflix, Google. I mean, these some of these stocks are down twenty percent, but they're still up huge on the year. So yeah, yes, this is how um, insane the stock market had become. You had this massive move into momentum trades and the FANG trades and passive ETFs. And that's why it's so dangerous because you take the, you take the stairway up and the elevator or the window down. And I wrote about this a couple of weeks ago, Elijah, that I predict there's going to be a time soon where the NYSE uh, lock limit rules kick in where the stock market closes for 15 minutes, goes down 7%, 15%, 20%, and the stock market closed down for the day. Because there's just, the the, the capital, uh, the the rules, the Dodd-Frank rules, the capital ratios in banks, uh, the Chinese wall, all these rules that have taken uh, banks out of the business of being that buffer, that cushion in principal trading are gone. 
And all of the active money managers are gone. They're dinosaurs. And one of the very few left is, is me because I have a very viable and, and uh, rigorously back-tested model. So everybody's piled into these passive ETFs and they all own the same few stocks and there's nobody underneath. So when the market goes no bid, it's going to go like it did yesterday down 833 points on the Dow. goes no bid. And that's just the Dow. The NASDAQ was even worse. So these momentum trades, all these get unwound very, very quickly. And if you're not hedged, there's a chance, I believe, that the market's going to go down 50% between now and the end of 19, 2019 or sometime between now and the end of 2019. So um, now's your chance. You still have some time. Well, the market, as you say, very uh, accurately, the market is still up marginally on the year. You still have time because there's a lot more downside to come. Mm -hmm. Right. And getting into the economy, you were writing recently about kind of two sectors that are a lar large portion of the economy, but they're not doing very well. So this whole narrative that the economy is doing very well, well, maybe not. So one of those uh, sectors, if we want to start out with, is real estate. How is yeah. that doing? Well, not very well. If you look at year over year uh, existing home sales, they're barely up at all. Pending home sales are down. In fact, year on year existing home sales are down. Permits are up a little bit. But uh, auto sales, the other part of the economy, are down. You know, it's, it was really great if you could go out and uh, get a car that's more like, looks like a seven year uh, car loan, kind of looks like more like a mortgage. It used to be. And you get it for 0% financing. Well, now that 0% financing is more like 5% financing. So that, this is why the, the auto sales are crashing. I and mean, I think Ford was down 11% year on year. The auto sales are crashing. Existing home sales are down. Not crashing, but they're down. New home sales are under pressure. Pending home sales. Uh, the, that second derivative has crashed. So um, if you take out housing and autos, from the economy, I mean, really, how good can it actually be? Not not very strong at all. Um, so, you, you know, listen, if you look at the uh, GDP projections for Q3, it's going to be about uh, about four percent, uh, three and a half to four percent growth rate. Um, if you look at New York, the New York Fed model and the Atlanta Fed model, it varies between three and four percent. That's still a very pretty robust economy. But that's in the rearview mirror. We're in Q4 now, Elijah. And I warned for, for a long time that the Q4 of 2018 was going to be the start of the calamity. And that's because of the reverse QE that's happening at the Federal Reserve. That's because the ECB just happened. You know, the bond market blew up. The bond yield soared and the and bond prices crashed in October. And the re one of the reasons for that is because the Fed – raised its quantitative tightening program to 50 billion a month and the ECB the European Central Bank went from 30 billion euros of printing a month to 15 billion euros and they're going to go to zero by the end of this year and that's when Italian debt just started to skyrocket you know I want to just tell you that you know what they're doing to Italy and I think it's wonderful in the long term but what's happening to Italy is that the Brussels, the European Union, is saying, hey, you guys got to balance your books. And by the way, the ECB is no longer going to be participating in, in your auctions for your debt. I mean, can you imagine if you said it to Japan? I mean, Japan and Italy are a lot alike. They both have the same demographics, horrible demographics, uh, and a huge debt to GDP ratio. In Japan, it's over 250 percent national debt to GDP. Uh their their bond market their their uh, ten year note in Japan is uh, about 0.1 percent, Elijah 0.1 percent, and they have uh, an insolvent nation with a two percent uh, inflation target. How I mean how the heck do you get a bond yield a bond yield at point at 0.1 percent? But imagine if the Bank of Japan told the Japanese bond market, the JGB bond market, that hey we're no longer going to buy any more of your bonds. No more. All these auctions are going to be on your own. I mean, they're still rolling over debt, but they're not participating in the auctions anymore. And they're not going to extend their, expand their balance sheet. You know what happened to the Japanese government bond? It was skyrocket beyond belief. Well, that's what's, that's what's happening in Italy. And that means that Mario Draghi is going to have to either allow Italian debt 
and Portuguese and Greece and the, t- and the stock markets to continue to plunge and bond markets prices continue to plunge yields to surge, which is going to unravel the euro. Or he's got to come back and say, you know what? I can't taper any longer. I am not going to raise interest rates in 2019. He's supposed to raise rates in the summer of 2019, the end of the, of the summer. He's going to have to come back and say, I can't do that. Or whoever's the head of the ECB. You know, the euro's going to crash either way, which puts more strength behind the U.S. dollar, which is already crushing the, 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 the uh, nascent cent, uh, uh, strength in the U.S. dollar, is already crushing the emerging markets. That's one of the main reasons why they're slowing. Of course, you have to add into the fact that China's huge debt bubble is no longer tenable. You know, you know, China, China makes me laugh, Elijah, because it, it one, it, on the one hand, they want to slow their economy down, right? And they want to deleverage their economy. But at the same token, they're trying to increase bank lending. And they're trying to support the yuan, but they want, they want to strengthen the yuan and, and support the yuan, but they want to increase credit. So I, the, I think the, China, the communist Chinese uh, government has no idea what they're doing any longer, and they're losing control. That's why the Shanghai index, by the way, while we lost 3% here in the United States, that was, you know, down over 5% overnight. And it's already down 30% from this high. So, you know, and when you add tariffs to this mix, you know, the, 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 the globally synchronized recovery mantra, which was to provide a never ending uh, glory to the stock market is over. No, you were talking about, you know, the European banking system and getting into Italy. I'd like to discuss a little bit more about that because you were saying in one of the articles you were recently writing that you think the entire European banking system could be at the risk of failure in 2019. Well, what, what is the <laughs> yes, because, you know, if who owns Italian bonds? I mean, the, the, the Italian bond market is owned by the banks of Europe and to a great extent, even in the United States, you know, what is Deutsche? You know, have you, I don't know if you looked at a chart of Deutsche Bank lately, but it's not exactly a, a pillar of strength. I mean, how many how many Portuguese, Greek and Italian bonds does Deutsche Bank own? And those bond prices are crashing as we speak, as we record this interview. So uh, these banks were already zombie banks in Italy. Most of them were zombie banks. In other words, they had no capital. They can't make any loans. Their assets are worth less than their life, than their than their deposits. Um, you can get a massive run on the banking system. I mean, we here's the thing, Elijah. We had 10 years of zero percent interest rates and all kinds of hell broke loose. In the markets, I mean, we we have record issuance in junk bonds, record issuance in in uh, leveraged loans and CLOs, and you know we have the Italians that were floating debt at next to nothing. But they were their their debt was less than a ten year note, and all of these anomalies and massive distortions are now unwinding because central banks are getting out of the game. And I want to tell you this. This is not a this is not a voluntary exit on the part of central banks. Central banks are getting out of this game because their inflation targets have been reached. If you look at core CPI here in the United States and headline CPI, they're both well above the Fed's two percent target. And I, we've been talking about asset bubbles since I came on the show this morning. Real estate prices are are at all time nominal highs. And if you look at home price to income ratios, they're pretty much close to the peak. Just below the peak they were in 2005 and six. So the central banks can do one of two things. Now that they've achieved their inflation targets, they can do nothing and keep their balance sheets growing and stay on the uh, floor in interest rates. And all all that's going to do is make inflation run intractable. And you know what that means? That these bond, <laughs> the, the bond market would implode anyway. Long-term bond yields would implode because you can't, you know, you know uh, anything that the, that central banks weren't actively buying, those yields would absolutely explode as their prices crashed. 
That's not really a very viable way to run an economy. So they really have no choice. They, you know, they've got their inflation. They have their bubble in asset prices. Now they're reacting to it. They will crush those bubbles that I just mentioned. And that's and if you don't have a model, I might model this economy. I'm here every day working for my clients, modeling these changes. And that's how I knew to be lightweight on equities to go net, uh, net neutral the portfolio before this debacle occurred. And I even got lucky. Thank God I got lucky enough to get the, the timing right. Q4 of 2018. Now, getting into that and coming full circle about how the central banks, you know, are kind of trapped and they need to raise interest rates. Um, and you're saying that's causing, you know, coming full circle here, that's causing a um, kind of correction in the stock market. You were saying it was 140 percent of GDP. The market cap for the stock market is 140 percent of GDP. It's normally about 60 percent. So more than double of what it should be. Sure. Now this correction. So, do you so think it's do you think it's going to drop more than fifty percent? Do you think the stock market is going to correct more than fifty percent? I do. I do. Let me, how about how's that for someone who doesn't equivocate? I do. Okay, awesome. I do. I think the stock market is going to drop very quickly. Several lock limit. Very possible. And I'm not. I, obviously, I'm not God. There's only one God, and He knows. I don't know. And neither do you. Nor does anybody else. But I'll tell you this: if you look at the the dynamics that I factor into my 20 point inflation, deflation and economic cycle model. If you look at those factors, they are telling, telling me that 2019 is very likely that we could get 50 percent, a 50 percent correction in the stock market because we're, or, or more because of the recession that's going to occur in that year. And by the way, if you look at the last two uh, recessions, that's what the stock market dropped, 50%. Now, in 2000, the NASDAQ dropped 80%. Okay, but neither of those times was the total market cap to GDP 150%. In 2000, it was 148, so it was very close. That was mostly because a handful of, of tech stocks were, 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 you know, through the roof. Now, the median PE ratio is at an all-time high. Stocks in general are at an all-time record high. But that's not even where the, the nucleus, see the nucleus of the bubble of 2000 was the NASDAQ. We know that. The nucleus of the bubble in 2005, 2008 was the housing market. We know that now. In, in arrears, it's easy to identify the bubble. Well, very few people know where the nucleus of the bubble is this time, but I think I do. And that's in the corporate bond market, which has absolutely exploded. We've tripled the amount of corporate bonds. And in the last 10 years, the amount of junk debt is up almost $3 trillion. Triple B is 60, let's put it this way, six, uh, two thirds of all of corporate debt is triple B or lower. So junk or triple B, triple B is the lowest, I'm sorry, is the, is the highest uh, 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 ranking right before uh, is, is the lowest ranking in investment rate. Okay, so it's one notch above junk. But if you look at the if you look at the composition of this triple B, it really is rated triple B as a falsehood, as a lie. That triple B should have been rated junk. So we have the highest amount of corporate debt nominally by a long shot, the highest amount of corporate debt as a percentage of the economy as that has ever been, forty five percent. And the composition of that debt, when you add in leveraged loans, is the lowest ever. Covenant light garbage. Companies that are just existing because they can issue debt to pay back existing debt. That's called a zombie company. When you have to, when you have to issue debt to pay back the, the interest on existing debt, then you're a zombie company. Those companies are going to go out of business in in rapid succession in 2019. That's where the recession is going to come from. It's in the corporate bond market. But it's not just the United States. Remember, this aberration and massive manipulation interest rates occurred 
globally. There is a global sovereign debt bubble where you had trillions of dollars worth of bonds issued by governments that paid less than zero. Okay? Governments got paid to issue debt. And that distorted and warped the entire fixed income spectrum. As that unwinds, as it is now, because of the inflation that central banks finally achieved,